Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're discussing nuclear weapons and efforts to abolish them with two activists from the Seattle, Washington area, Tara Vialba, who organizes with neighbor ten- neighborhood tenants and workers, and Thomas Rogers, who is a former Navy submarine captain now active with the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action. I will be joining them for a rally in Seattle on September 24th which can be found out about at abolishnuclearweapons.org. I hope we can inspire others to do the same sort of things in their towns. Tara Vialba and Tom Rogers, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. So thanks for what both of you have been doing for some time. Uh, What is being planned for September 24th? Tara, do you want to go first and then Tom? Sure. Um, On March 24th, there will be um, a a march in Seattle organized um, for the complete abolishment of nuclear weapons. Um, And uh, Tom, do you want to share the details? Well, sure. I mean, uh, hopefully uh, the weather's nice and we're not really going to wait till March. We're going to do it in September 24th. And then we're going to march. Uh, but it's a rally uh, at a park in Seattle. Uh, and then uh, a a march uh, down the middle of uh, some big roads uh, that uh, are being cleared. And hopefully we'll have uh, enough people to make an impact. Um, and uh, the uh, rally uh, will uh, terminate at the uh, Henry M. Jackson Federal Building uh, in Seattle. Uh, and there will be uh, speakers uh, talking about various uh, aspects of the nuclear uh, weapons uh, issues. I wonder if uh, I could ask just briefly how the two of you got involved in this uh, issue, which seems one of the most pressing in the world to me, but uh, one of the least acted upon. Um, how did how did you come to to be where you are? Hmm. Well, I was a naval officer, um, and I commanded a an attack submarine uh, during the Cold War, um, served on lots of submarines uh, over a 32-year career. But after the end of the Cold War, um, I was still in the Navy. I didn't retire until 98. The Cold War ended in 1991. And I really became disenchanted with efforts uh, in the uh, Clinton administration to um, pay the peace dividend. Uh, The the Cold War was over and uh, what we did was build up, not not build down. And uh, so I became uh, increasingly vocal. Uh, I wasn't going to make admiral, so uh, that wasn't a problem. And uh, and I was uh, senior enough that I could uh, talk and people couldn't tell me to shut up. Um, then, uh, after I retired from the Navy, I found my way to ground zero and have been, uh, working as a, a nuclear weapons abolition activist, uh, gosh, for 22 years. Seems a very interesting background. I want to ask Tara the same question in a minute, but Tom, uh, there, there seemed to be a step left out there between keeping the weaponry at the proper level and abolishing it all. <laughs> had we abolished it all, you wouldn't have had the career you were you were in all of those years. How did you how did you make that? Well, actually, one of the best days of my uh, career was uh, in 1989 when the uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, were abolished unilaterally in the U.S. and uh, and I was standing on the deck of the submarine watching the crane take these uh, nuclear weapons out of my ship and. Uh, and that was a good day. And I got to get down uh, into the torpedo room after they were gone and and uh, address the uh, nuclear weapons security guard and say, okay, you're done. And that, that was it. Uh, but um, 
there is a <laughs> there's still a navy <laughs> and uh we still have armed forces and uh, although we have you know the militarism is just another problem that we don't uh need to address today but um the uh, there's still a place for uh, the submarine force in a uh, non-nuclear world uh, not the world Attack I want. submarines I'm talking about. <laughs> not uh, the world I want to live in. We may agree to disagree on that. On that one, Tara. Oh, sure. Tara, how did you get get involved in in anti nuclear weapons activism? Um, well, I came in actually through anti militarism. Um, I grew up in the Philippines at a time when the Philippines was. Um, held under martial law by a dictatorship that was supported by the United States. And so I grew up um, experiencing firsthand what the damage is of this thing that the U.S. called low intensity conflict. You know, are people fighting us about whether or not the U.S. military bases could get to stay in the Philippines and what that meant for the local economy and the exploitation of women um, who were around the military basis. And so I came I came to it from that perspective. Years later, I was living in Washington State and um, and I found out from a presentation from someone in, with um, the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility that um, Washington State holds the biggest portion of nuclear weapons of the U.S. arsenal and that if we were a country, we would be the third largest nuclear weapons holder. And I didn't know that, um, that in the state I lived in, that was the case. And so that's how I got into um, the work of abolishing nuclear weapons. That's like Russia, number one, the rest, the other 49 states, number two, and then Washington state is the third biggest. Right. Yep. Uh, yeah, yes. quite a record. Yeah. Um, You've you've written, Tara, you've written recently about organizing against nuclear weapons in communities of color and poor communities uh, where uh, the general wisdom is always that people have too many pressing needs to work on anything uh, distant in time or place. How has that uh, organizing been going? It's slow. Um, and it really takes the form of um, <laughs> taking seriously all the other struggles that poor people um, encounter. Um, just this weekend, I was with the Washington State Poor People's Campaign, where we were talking about, you know, housing, um, um, white supremacist violence targeting communities of color, and what that has to do with um, militarism, and then with nuclear weapons, the domination logic that's inside nuclear weapons, and how that shows up in policing, for example, or in the border patrol, for example, or the weapons transfers between the military and our local law enforcement. Um, those are all part of that. And um, when I tell people, poor people and working people, what the nuclear weapons program costs in the United States, everyone's mind is blown about it. You know, nobody, nobody really knows how much nuclear weapons and the military in general take from the from from the resources that we could be using for well-being, and then nobody really knows what they contribute to things like greenhouse gases and 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 environmental destruction, even though we see it, nobody really quantifies it. Yeah. And and the few people who find out how enormous the military budget is don't tend to know that the nukes are pretty much in and are the majority of the so-called energy budget, which is which is a separate thing, right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, abolishing nuclear weapons is central to where we are around energy policy and around environmental policy, which impacts the lives of poor people, including farm workers, including you know, food workers, including unhoused people, like people often say, you know, that the impacts of a nuclear attack or a nuclear weapons detonation or an accident um, uh, doesn't, doesn't see race or class or anything like that. But if you're unhoused and you're outside doing something like that, the impacts on you are going to be completely different than someone who has a basement. 
and can go and shelter someplace in, you know, safely. It's, um, we don't really talk about that in the nuclear abolition community, but that's the, that's the reality that we face. Yeah, I, I think we worry that a big enough nuclear apocalypse, we're all going to die some just a little faster. But uh, yeah, the great equalizer, right? In some ways, yeah. Uh, but Tom, we're gonna we're gonna rally and make demands and hope they're heard by the congressional delegation from Washington State. Uh, you have some thoughts on particular demands uh, for what the U.S. government ought to be doing now, right? Absolutely. Um, we came perilously close to losing the uh, New Start Treaty uh, in 2021 at the end of the Trump administration. Um, and, uh, let's see, uh, the, uh, inauguration was January 20th. Uh, new start was, uh, uh, scheduled to expire on February 6th. And I don't know why, but for some reason during the last, uh, months of the Trump administration, uh, they weren't doing a lot of negotiations. I, I don't know what that was about, but, uh, the uh, current administration got right in there and uh, agreed to extend with Russia the New START, which is the single uh, most effective treaty we have for uh, both maintaining and uh, reducing uh, the uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so our, my first call uh, is for both the U.S. and Russia to dismantle the non-deployed nuclear weapons uh, that we uh, have in, in the stockpile. Uh, there's uh, 12,500 warheads in the world, uh, and the uh, U.S. and Russia uh, control over 11,000 of them. Um, but only about 3,200 are, are deployed, uh, able to be used in, in a, 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 sign or a, a short time. That other 8,000 are, are weapons that could and should uh, be dismantled. And one of the problems with uh, New START is it doesn't control non-deployed weapons. And uh, although there were lots of reductions uh, post-Cold War from 1991 to uh, 2010, uh, the numbers have been flat for the last 12 years. Um, between 2010 and 2022, um, the U.S. and Russian uh, inventories have been the same. Uh, they have been very close to the maximum allowed by uh, New START. And um, the, the, that was a disappointment uh, for us activists because we thought New START was a good stepping stone to further reductions. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that the new new start um, that has to be negotiated uh, before 2026 uh, does result in further reductions. But the first thing we can do unilaterally and also call on Russia to do unilaterally is to dismantle the uh, retired and obsolete warheads that are intact, sitting in storage. And for the U.S., uh, there's about 1,500 warheads uh, down in Albuquerque uh, waiting to be uh, dismantled, and they're just sitting there. And uh, it's all about funding. It's all about priorities. And uh, we need to generate some inertia, some momentum yeah. uh, to get moving and getting those numbers down. And um, and you're talking about something that's really doable uh, apart from any treaty, right? Unilateral. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And without affecting the national security policy that's stated in the the nuclear posture review, it, it, they're just they're just junk. 
Yeah. So, yeah I mean, some people might suggest uh, Tom or Tara, some people might suggest it's more urgent to take the, the weapons off the missiles or to or to get rid of the, the land based ICBMs or to or to rejoin some of the treaties that have been torn up the anti ballistic missile or intermediate range treaty or to abide by the non-proliferation treaty or join the new treaty on the prohibition of nukes. Uh, but this seems like the easiest thing to do where there isn't any argument against doing it other than somebody's making a buck off, off nuclear weapons. It's, is, am I right? I call that low hanging fruit. Yeah. Um, it, Tara, I, I I read some some things that you've written on on this topic, and it, it seems to me that we're we're not just talking about you know not just the destruction of all life on Earth, but through the process of maintaining all these weapons and generating all this waste and testing them and using them. There's really no clear line between this anti-nuclear activism and pro-environment activism, is there? No, you're absolutely right. There isn't. You know, the thing about um, abolishing nuclear weapons that um, we don't quite talk about as much is that, you know, uh, is considering the true cost of nuclear weapons. So if we were to look at what it costs to compensate people who were exposed to radiation when they were mining for uranium to use in nuclear weapons. If we were to compensate the people that were harmed in testing, like the people in the Marshall Islands, um, if we were to, cut, to also factor in what it would cost to remediate the environment, say at the Midnight Mine in Spokane in Washington, where they mine for uranium in an open pit mine, you know, that has now contaminated um, rivers throughout that area of Washington state. If we talk about the harm that Hanford has caused in, um, in central Washington, in, in, in Eastern and central Washington, you know, if we factored all of that and said the US military has to be responsible for the harm that they caused and we actually made the US government pay for that. Then we took a look at, well, what resources there left over to start another generation of nuclear weapons, so many people would be on the same page about, we can't afford, we, couldn't, we can't even afford to pay for the damage from the previous generation. What makes our government think that we can afford to cause this kind of damage in the future? You know, it, so if we look at it um, holistically, the cost of nuclear weapons is not just the making of the weapons, but but actually much bigger. And the U.S. government hasn't paid for most of the cost of nuclear weapons. There are there are people who claim that nuclear weapons do some sort of good in the world, that the existence of nuclear weapons is why there's been no World War Three, that if Ukraine had only had a pile of nuclear weapons, Russia would never have done anything against Ukraine. And you can push back that, well, if you hadn't put nuclear capable missile bases into Poland and Romania aimed at Russia, maybe you would have gotten al along a little better with Russia, et cetera. But what do you, what do you say to people who think there's, the, you know, we, there've been a few near misses, we'll survive okay, we'll keep getting lucky, but we, we have to have them. Otherwise, you know, all hell will break loose. What, what do you say to these people? Well, I actually would say, you know, I'd actually say that with, I would use the example of China. You know, China has undergone huge industrial and economic development, and they have, you know, um, sought to um, actually eliminate absolute poverty, which they have made incredible progress towards. And their nuclear arsenal is not even a third of what is in Washington state alone. You know, we, we have more than triple as a state what China has as a country. And so clearly it isn't the nuclear weapons that has allowed um, countries to be able to develop and to set policy that is that that seeks to say eliminate uh, to, to eliminate poverty, absolute poverty. You know, that isn't nuclear weapons is not central to that. 
it is central to making people afraid. And that's what I think is what we're dealing with here in the United States. And am I right? talk to people uh, about that sort of thing. Uh, I always get the, the uh, answer that, well, yeah, we might uh, abolish all the nuclear weapons, but the other guys are going to cheat and they're going to hide some and then they're going to attack us. And um, what we have proved, I believe, what we have shown with New START is that the Russia, Russia and the United States have uh, agreed to intrusive inspections and notifications of uh, all weapons deployments and movements, on-site inspection, overhead inspection, and there is a level of confidence that there are technical means to verify the uh, presence or absence of nuclear weapons. And if you project that to worldwide abolition and fund the uh, United Nations arm, uh, the IAEA, uh, to do those inspections, then, uh, well, I'm not, my grandchildren aren't going to worry about uh, nuclear attack and uh, they'll put their money uh, into uh, more worthwhile endeavors. And and is it not true that Iran agreed to even more invasive inspections than anybody else had ever had, and they were going pretty darn well until somebody tore up the agreement? Yeah. Yes, yeah. the United States <laughs> did that. You know, it's sort of, I mean, it's just, it's a very expensive, very destructive um, um, distraction from what people actually need. People actually need housing proper wages, health care, an affordable education, you know, all of those things are what people actually say will make them feel secure and safe. And instead, we're putting billions of dollars into these weapon systems. Trillions. There are, and, and, and you're talking about China. China, correct me if I'm wrong, also doesn't have the missiles ready to go with the weapons so that they aren't, they can't be forced into deciding within seconds or minutes whether to launch them all or not. They've got a, a delay built in that everyone should have built in, right? That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. China doesn't have hair trigger alert weapons. Yeah. The, uh, the 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 big problem uh, for me uh, on, on that subject is the uh, the ground based weapons, the ICBMs uh, in the the Midwest uh, that are totally vulnerable targets, um, and that creates the instability of the use them or lose them or launch. It's called the strategy is called launch on warning. Um, if well, I think they just shot their missiles at us, so we better get ours out of the silos quick or else we won't be able to use them. Um, it, it's an obsolete weapon system uh, because of the capability to uh, to take it out. Um, the, uh, the next iteration of New START, I think, should reduce the number of deployed missiles or warheads to what they call a minimum deterrent, which would probably be about 500 warheads. The first thing you do to achieve that is decommission every land-based missile silo yeah. and dismantle those those uh, warheads. Negotiating. Yeah, if you think about where those are, it isn't in the backyards of wealthy people. We're talking about you know, states where um, they are not the wealthiest states. You know, these are not in New York City. They are not in L.A. They are in remote rural areas. And the people that we would be, quote unquote, you know, the, the, they call it, they talk about it as like a sponge, you know, like that it would absorb something, you know, it, the, 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 the damage from being attacked. Those are their people. That that is a that that's a natural environment. They are there are animals and people there, and we can't just say, oh well, you know, there aren't that many of them. And anyway, they're poor. They're not wealthy. You know, they're not Bill Gates. They're not whoever. Um, it, it's it's not acceptable. 
Uh, absolutely not. Um, there, there is also the problem that we've seen uh, in in Ukraine of concern over nuclear power plants, and we all the time are seeing new countries turn to nuclear power clearly because they want to be closer to having nuclear weapons. Uh, and we have people telling us against all evidence that nuclear power is a green solution, uh, although nobody knows what to do with the waste, et cetera. Uh, do we have, can we get rid of the nuclear weapons without getting rid of nuclear power? Can we get rid of the nuclear weapons without getting rid of war and militarism? Is this, a, is this something we can do uh, on its own? I want to I want to encapsulate it. I, I I want it to be a narrow issue that is existential and if we get rid of the nuclear weapons we won't die of nuclear war. Uh the other stuff uh are other problems that that need to be worked on. But man, when you start dismantling weapons and get those numbers down to a few thousand you know i could do that for a hundred thousand dollars i could i could dismantle all the weapons in the world and uh it's easy yeah it just oh, takes I, the political will to do it we'd do it for free i think if they'd let us yeah. <laughs> well, exactly but, you know, we would late, get trained for free the, the, <laughs> The, the late Mikhail Gorbachev said, as long as the U.S. military has the so-called conventional weapons and bases and does what it's doing with them, little countries like North Korea will never, ever get rid of the nuclear weapons. Uh, it's, you, you can't mm -hmm. have one. You can't have both of those things. Um, well, so see, you, that's, and that's where, you know, our movement, our movement needs people like Tom and it needs people like you and me. We need people who also have you know the understanding that like we can't transition into a different economy that actually supports life for all people not just for rich people in rich countries but for all people if we continue with the kind of consumer consumption that is defended by nuclear weapons and the US military we can't do it we have to People in wealthy countries have to give up their levels of entitlement to the world's resources. And that entitlement isn't just like a weird little entitlement. It's entitlement that's backed up by militaries, some of the most armed and, and wealthiest militaries in the world. And that's, that's at the crux of this issue. Nuclear weapons is one of the issues, but the larger issue is the domination of this type of thinking that, er, that, that wealthy people can take whatever they want. We have less than a minute left. The website for the event in Washington, in Seattle on September 24th is abolishnuclearweapons.org. Uh, what can people do to learn more? What should people be doing uh, where they are in the world? Well, uh, Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action uh, has a pretty good web page uh, with links to uh, other information. Uh, just uh, go Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action. Uh, just Ground Zero will get you to the one in New York. W wonderful. Uh, Tom Rogers and Tara Vialba, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.